Probability methods are possible when you have a sampling frame or a complete list of elements of all possible members of the population. One of the big advantages of probability sampling methods is that they're generalizable. Using inferential statistics, we can estimate how far off we are from the true population parameter. Probability sampling methods are those in which you have a sampling frame or a complete list of all the elements in a population. This means that you, can, you know the exact odds of selection of each element, and it's not zero. In order to use a probability sampling method, you have to have a truly random method of selecting elements. There has to be no systematic bias within the system. And as I said at the beginning, you must have a sampling frame. Remember, just because you selected your elements randomly doesn't mean you had a sampling frame. Standing out in the quad and shutting your eyes and spinning around and picking the students you point at seems random, but it doesn't meet the criterion for statistical randomness. You must have a list. You must have a way of selecting randomly from that list. Are probability methods error-free? Does knowing the odds of selection of each element eliminate errors due to chance? No. Anomalous samples are still possible. We could sample the population of students here at Cal Poly Pomona and get a sample that actually isn't representative. Ideally, if done properly though, hopefully we'll get a representative sample. The idea behind generalizability is the idea of the central limit theorem. If we were to take samples from the same population over and over again, the sample of samples would start to look like the normal curve, with more of the samples being close to the population parameter and fewer of the samples being further away from the population parameter. Using the idea of the central limit theorem, and standard error, we can construct confidence intervals just as we do for the mean and the standard deviation. The confidence intervals we conduct with the standard error tell us how confident we are that the true population parameter lies within a certain point of the mean of our sample. Is error affected by sample size? Absolutely. The larger the sample, the more confidence we can have in its representativeness. The more homogeneous a sample, a population, the more confidence we can have in a sample. The fraction of the total population doesn't matter. It's the total number in the sample. Remember, probability sampling rests on the idea of randomness. We have to have a mathematically random way of generating who ends up in our sample from the population. Each element has to have an equal chance of selection. If your sample isn't random, it's not going to be generalizable. By using a random sample, we can statistically estimate sampling error, or the deviation between the results in our sample and the true population parameter. In order to have a truly random sample, you must have a sampling frame. Everyone has to have an equal odds of selection. Remember, just because I know the total number of something doesn't mean every element has an equal odds of selection. The most basic type of probability sampling method is what's called a simple random sample. In a simple random sample, you simply take your sampling frame and find some way to randomize that list. Then you select elements one way of doing this would be the typical bingo spinner. Another would be to assign a number to everyone on the list and use a random number generator. Now keep in mind there is no replacement. So let's say I have 20, a list of 20,000 Cal Poly Pomona students, give or take a few, and I need a sample of 1,000. Even though the first person had a 1 in 20,000 chance of being selected, the next person has a 1 in 19,999 chance of being selected. We don't worry about that. We just say if, the equal, if they have equal odds of selection on the first draw, 
that's equal odds of selection. Systematic random sampling is very similar to simple random sampling. In this case, you have a randomized list of elements, and you know what proportion of that list you need in your sample. What, as long as your list is in a random order, and you select a random place to start, then you take every however many number elements you need. So to summarize, how to conduct a, a systematic random sample, first figure out what proportion you need. So if there's 2,000 people in your population and you need a sample of 250, you need every fourth person. Of course, you need to make sure your list is in a random order. Even alphabetical order isn't really a random order. Different ethnicities are more likely to have last names that start with certain letters. So even though alphabetical order seems like it's random, it's really not. You also need to pick a random place to start on the list. You can use a random number generator or a dice to do that. Then you would take every however many cases you need. For stratified random sampling, you're still drawing from a sampling frame a random list, but in this case there's something important about the population that you need to represent either proportionate to what it is in the population or disproportionately. In this case, you divide the sampling frame into what's called strata. So let's say I want to make sure that ethnicity is represented in a particular way. Then I would divide my sample by ethnicity and make sure I drew the correct proportion randomly from each ethnic group. Stratified random sampling might be done in a proportionate or a disproportionate way. Proportionate stratified random sampling matches the proportion that exists in the population to that in your sample. Let's say 20% of the students here at Cal Poly Pomona are freshmen and 30% are seniors. If I were to, get to do a proportionate stratified random sampling in which your, your rank in school was important, I would want to make sure that within my sample I asked 20% of freshmen and 30% seniors. Disproportionate stratified random sampling is when I oversample or undersample a particular element and set of elements in the population. Why might I sample disproportionately? A group might be so small that without oversampling them, there wouldn't be enough people to do any kind of statistical testing on that group. In other cases, I might want equal numbers of elements rather than the proportion in which they, li they are listed in the population. A cluster is a naturally occurring mixed aggregate of elements in the population. What does that mean? Well, if I were hired to do a survey for the CSU system, people in the CSU are already grouped. They're grouped by university. With a cluster sample, there could be a sample frame, but it might be very difficult to compile. If I were hired by the CSU, even though there's a master list at each campus, I might need to put all those lists together. In addition, it might be too expensive to go to every campus in the CSU. So instead, I might select a few campuses and then draw random samples at each of those campuses. It's not quite as good as stratified random sampling or simple random sampling because there is some bias in how elements are clustered, but it's still generally considered a random sampling method. Usually, we do cluster sampling when the cost of developing the sampling frame is too high or the cost of administering the, the survey in that way would be too great. The main advantage to a cluster sample is the amount of savings you have in time and money. The main disadvantage is that it may not truly be random. Cluster sampling might be multi-stage. For example, the state of California might decide to survey school districts. Then, they, first, they might select among the school districts in the, in the state of California, and then they might select among the schools in those districts. Right? So the first level is the school district, the second level is the schools. If you have a sampling frame or the resources to develop one, I highly recommend a probability sampling method. The generalizability will be valuable to your study.